culture, and uh, specifically in this, uh, from last week, and uh, now also this week, setting priorities, or uh, having some set priorities in your life, and realizing that uh, what you prioritize is, are the things that you hold near and dear to you. Um, as I said last week, uh, uh, prior, you know, what, you hold, uh, what you prioritize or the priorities you set help establish the culture in your, in your own life, and it establishes the culture in your surroundings. Um, what, and, and priorities are the things you consider the most. And so last week, we, we spoke a little bit about just the fact of uh, how some self-priorities and how sometimes we prioritize things and, and really haven't uh, consciously made those priorities, but yet they have become priorities because of our anger, fear, and so forth and so on. So we talked a lot about that, just, just what happens with us. Um, and so uh, there are things that, that the priorities that exist in our own lives, and we have to examine ourselves and see, okay, what is our highest priority? What things do we consider most important? What things have become most important, even though we're not cognizant of that fact? Uh, that's not, not something we consciously made most important, but yet has become most important. And we've had to, and, and we do have to examine ourselves because you can't just, you know, roll along in life. You've got to make some examinations. You have to take stock of yourself and recognize, you know, why do I have this unnecessary fear? Why am I unnecessarily angry? Why do I face, go through this? Or why do I go through this thing or that thing? Or whatever the case may be and figure out sometimes, ask the Lord what the root of that is, and begin to then work on that so that these things don't have that priority in your life. You're not just, you know, you know going off, or you're not just, you know, having unreasonable fear, uh, and, and, and you have no control over it. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is how we set priority, priorities in our culture or in our society, because I think that's important. Uh, um, it, what, what the world prioritizes does affect the culture as a whole. We see that in, uh, in the mainstream media. Uh, we see that in how things operate on a regular basis in the world we live in, what the newspapers say, what the, what the talking heads scream at you all the time. You know? And this is, we're living in a unique time period because we're in a time period where you can have 24-hour news. No, it used to be, back when I was a kid, it used to be, you know, you, everybody waited until 6 o'clock, and that's when the news came on all across the nation at 6 o'clock, and only if something was just absolutely devastating did they break in and have a special news flash. Otherwise, you know, you got the news at 6 o'clock with Walter Cronkite or Huntley and Brinkley or whoever the, these people, you know, the different people. You got that news at 6 o'clock, and, and, and your parents would, you know, at 6 o'clock turn on the news and, and listen to what, you know, what was going on in the world. We didn't have in, instant access. So there were things that were happening in other parts of the world you didn't find out till some, you know, two, three days, sometime a week or two weeks later or a month later. Then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, this happened last month in, in such and such place. And uh, so we didn't have that instant access. Today, you have instant access. Today, the media has understood, and they understand something that most of us don't understand, and that is they understand that they can shape the culture and they can shape society by what they present and how they present it. Because it's just not enough to say this is the news, but, they, but, but many times what they end up doing is they present it in a certain way, and the reason they do that is to get you to think a certain way. So really, all the information, and you have, you know, we all have iPads, smartphones. We, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, 24-hour news channels, uh, CNN and Fox and NS, MSNBC and this one. I mean, there's just a plethora of 24-hour uh, news channels, or what they call they call themselves news channels, and 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 yet. You know, everything is, is just in your face all the time. It's, it's you know, that everything is a crisis. Everything is this. Everything is that. You know, from the, from the highest office, the president on down, everything is, is, you know, every day there's a new crisis. Every day there's something new. Not too long ago, there was a, a guy who sat up in a hotel in Las Vegas and killed 58, 59 people and injured 800 more people. And that was what, a month or two ago? And already, that is not, no longer in the news cycle. Now that's something that we should, still should be talking about and evaluating, but yet it's no longer in the news cycle. And most people have forgotten all about it until all of a sudden they may say, oh yeah, we think we have another suspect. And then after a couple of days, that's dropped out. Why? Because it's always 
There's something new. There's something else. There's, and it's all designed to shape the culture that we live in. Have you noticed, and I don't know if you have, and this is why you have to be careful about what your kids watch on television, even when it comes down to Disney. You think, well, Disney's okay. I mean, it's Disney. It's kids. Well, you got to be careful because even Disney has an agenda. It, the, the, I'm telling you, they have agendas. And, and so, but have you noticed? Now, now he, here's the thing. And, and, and you know, you, whether, you, you know, whether the people out there who watch this and, oh, he's a terrible person for saying this, I don't care. So don't write me no letters. <laughs> just, just don't. <laughs> but, but here's the deal. Okay, you have, now, according to, according to demographics and everything else, Homosexuals are 2 to 3% of the population. But every television show has a homosexual character. I want to be honest with you. And everybody says, oh, yeah, you got a friend who is. I'm going to tell you this. I do not have any friends who are homosexuals. Well, you ought to. I don't and don't want any. Will I minister to people who are, are, are that, you know, living that lifestyle? Yes, I will. And I'll minister to them compassionately. But I don't know anybody personally, intimately, no, no, no one in my family is that I know of. But yet, they per the reason I say that is because the lie is perpetrated that, oh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and there's, a, there's several in every family, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not. It's 2 to 3% of the population. That means there's 350 million people in this country. What's 2% of that? That's a handful. And yet, what's in your face all the time is their concerns and, and this, that, the other, and so forth and so on. They've rode the backs of the civil rights movement to acquire all, this, all these rights, civil rights. And I mean, and, and let's, I'm gonna tell you, they wrote the back of the civil rights movement, the African-American civil rights movement. They've been on that train, man. They've been on that train and wrote it successfully to the point where African-Americans still don't have the things and have the recognition. And still, if you put in a a, a, a resume, and your name is, what, give me, give me what, you know, no, no, like, you know, Kanisha, I hope I'm not saying anybody's name here, but, you know, and, and, yet, and, and many times, and most, a lot of, a lot of places of employment, ah, pff, they throw it away. We're still facing that kind of thing. Every single, almost every single television show. Why? Because the media has determined that they're going to mainstream this thing and twist the way you think so that you agree with it and say, well, it's not so bad. It's okay. And it's not just that. They do it with so many other things. They do it with just about everything. You know, we look at marijuana in this country. How many states have now agreed and, and made marijuana legal? A lot. And whether people are, will agree with me or not, the fact is the fact is the fact is the fact, and that is marijuana is what they call a gateway drug. It does open you up for harder drugs. Not to say everybody who smokes marijuana is going to do uh, uh, you know, other drugs, but it is a gateway. Many people will. Well, everybody smokes marijuana. I don't. I don't know people who do. Well, Pastor, you just must be, you just insulated. No, I'm not insulated. I get around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that I know of. I'll put it that way. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to say it. That I know of. I'm not insulated. But it's just the fact that what the media portrays and what reality is is two different things. What reality is is everybody doesn't know everybody, other, a bunch of other people who are doing all this stuff unless you run in those circles. But, but guess what? Everybody ain't running in those circles. Hello, come on now. 
Everybody's not involved in, in, in those areas of life. Because, see, kingdom people, we have to separate ourselves and set ourselves apart. Let me, can I tell you something? Here's the problem with the church. The problem with the church is we're trying to get along with the world. We're trying to work within the system. I'm not sure when that happened. I think it probably happened around the time of Emperor Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, around 300 and some odd, you know, A.D., when he was in a battle or about to go into battle, and he saw a sign in the sky that said, conquer in, or, you know, you, you know conquer in this Sign and, and he saw, he said, claims he saw the sign of a cross. And he went and he won the battle. And so he then said, Ah, this, this you know, that was God and, and Christianity is real. And so instantly, you know, Christianity became sociably acceptable, socially acceptable in Rome. And everybody got saved. Well, what began to happen, begins to happen is, of course, all these people were worshiping other gods. Now all of a sudden they're supposed to be worshiping Jesus, but yet they don't cut loose the other gods. And pretty soon Christianity gets watered down. It becomes this, it becomes that. It becomes a state religion. And over a period of time, the power and majesty of the kingdom becomes diluted. Because no, no longer is it, is it a separate kingdom now is mixed in with everything, all the world's situations, all the world's religions, all the world, you know, all that stuff is mixed in. And so through, since that time, I believe since that time, what's, what's begun to happen, and even especially today, and especially in America, we feel, many Christians feel, America is a Christian nation. Well, it's not. You read the Constitution, it is not a Christian nation. It doesn't say it's a Christian nation. It is absolutely not a Christian nation. Now, there might be a number of Christians here. There might be a lot of us here. We may have churches everywhere. We may have religious freedom, but that does not make you a Christian nation because the Christian nation will reflect God, will reflect Christ. It will reflect the kingdom, and this doesn't do that. But yet, what we find is we're trying to get along. We're trying to, you know, we're going to change it. We're going to work within the system. Well, the problem is the system is corrupt. The problem is the system's, the system's foundation is evil, is sin. And every system of the world is. It's based on sin. The kingdom is something separate. And so what we're trying to do then is work within a corrupt system and make it so it's no longer corrupt. Well, that's not going to work because its very foundation is corruption. So how can you make something whose very foundation is corruption make it no longer corrupt? That's why God is going to, you know, there's coming a point when God is, even though Jesus is going to conquer the devil, he's going to rule this earth for a thousand years, but that's not the ultimate plan or the end. The ultimate end is the heavens and earth will pass away. Why? Because they are corrupt and God is not going to, God is not going to fix a corrupt system. He's going to destroy the corrupt system and start, a, uh, start anew. You hear what I'm saying? Well, then why is the church trying to work with any corrupt system? So, and, but that's what we're always doing. Case in point, in the past uh, uh, previous election, you had all kind of evangelicals saying, oh, we need to vote for this man, uh, Donald Trump, for president. We've got to vote for him. We've, he, you know, he's our best chance. You're Christians. You serve King Jesus. Listen, evangelicals, you serve Jesus. You are the keepers of the kingdom on earth. You are kingdom citizens. You are the men and women. We all are the men and women who are kingdom citizens on this planet. And our goal is to spread the kingdom of God. We don't do that through a president elected in a corrupt nation. And that's, that's whether it's the United States, whether it's Europe, uh, you know, England, whether it's France, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a country in Africa, whether it's a country in Europe, a country in America, it doesn't matter. We, are, we cannot look to the leaders of those countries 
corrupt countries, because every single one is, mind you, and say, ah, this is going to be our best hope. No, your best hope is the king of the kingdom. That's your best hope. And if you don't see that, then what you'll continue to do is invest, as we evangelicals in this country have done, time and time again, we will invest our money, we'll invest our time, we'll invest our thinking, we'll invest our reputations into people who are, who are when it's all said and done, are not going to stand for your agenda. They're not going to stand for your agenda. So why do we continue to do it? Then we get disappointed and then we say, oh, well, it's the liberal left or it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the righteous right or whatever they call it. I don't know. What they call it. Who knows? It's the right. It's the left. And, we're, and, and, you know, we're pointing at each other rather than stopping and saying, wait a minute, we are kingdom people. Our highest priority, our highest priority is the kingdom of God. Not the President of the United States, or not the uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of England, not the Prime Minister of Australia. Our highest uh, priority is the kingdom of God and the king of the kingdom. That's who we get behind, and that's who we stand behind. But we've been twisted and, and, and manipulated to, to, and in the church, how many churches are accepting perverse lifestyles? How many churches are accepting, the, you know, this and that? I mean, and the list goes on and on. How many churches are accepting abortion? I mean, the list goes on and on. Well, you know, and we know scripturally. I mean, come on, it's clear as bell in the, it's clear, it's, it clear can be in the Bible. But then we use some twisted logic to say, oh, well, you know, God, we're no different than the Pharisees. We're no different than the children of Israel that wandered in the desert. Then when Moses left, we went out and played, as the Bible says, worshiping, worshiping a, a golden calf. And we sit up in the church and say, oh, we'll never do that. We do it every day. We do it all the time. Because instead of listening to God, instead of uh, uh, making the kingdom our highest priority, we listen to the media, we listen to what it, what the, all the talking heads, we listen to everything that comes across our iPads and our iPhones and all the 24-hour news cycles and, and what, some, who, you know, what somebody said at work and what's going on over here. And we, 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 put, we take and put all that stuff in our minds, our heads, and our, our, ourselves. And then we formulate opinions and, and not realize you've been manipulated or as, as, they, as they say, you've been hoodwinked and bamboozled and don't even know it. No, we're not here to work within the system. We're not here to say, hey, man, you know, we're going to, we're, 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 you know, that's our guy. We're going to put our guy in the White House. Doesn't matter. You can, put, you can take the most ardent Christian, put him in the White House, but the laws, the laws of the country will prevent him from enacting a kingdom agenda. We need saved people in politics, and how is that going to enable them to enact a kingdom agenda? It's not going to allow them to do that. So, we're not here to work within the system. We're here to replace it. That's our job, and that's our function. That the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're here to replace the system. We're not here to get along with, 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 uh, with you know, the government and all those folks. We're not here to do all that. We're here to replace this thing. We're here to say, this is what the Bible says. This is the, the kingdom of God. Listen, when Jesus comes back for his millennial reign, he is not going to take, he is not going to take any government system that is in operation today and say, aha, this is how we're going to operate based on what, what's going on in the United States or based on what's going on in Russia or what's going on in China or what's going on in, in the UK. This is how, we, no, he's bringing kingdom principles he's bringing the kingdom of God on earth and it's going to be a government 
like you've never seen before. Like you've never seen before. That's why Isaiah said the government shall be upon his shoulders. Not Congress's shoulders. Not the Senate's shoulders. His, Jesus' shoulders and his shoulders alone. And so we find that what, a, what, the, what does the world prioritize? It's surely not prioritizing the kingdom. Because if it was, it would have kingdom principles in operation, kingdom laws. It would have kingdom customs and, and values. Well, what, let's look at what some of the values of the, of, the, of the world we live in. Let's look at what they do prioritize. If this was a, listen, if this was a kingdom country then the customs and the societal norms would discourage divorce and adultery. Wouldn't they? They would discourage divorce and adultery. But we don't see that. Today we have no fault divorce. I remember the day when, when if a couple had to get, we wanted to get divorced, man, they had to go through something. The courts didn't just say, okay, well, you know, you go your way, you go. Hey, no, 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 uh-uh, no, 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 no. And, 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 you know, you had to go through a whole lot of stuff, and there was time involved. There was a lot of money involved no, normally because it was designed to discourage the breakup of the family, not encourage. Then all of a sudden they came up with a new thing, no-fault divorce. Not your fault, not your fault. Well, somebody's fault. Somebody did something. I always love when people say, well, you know, we're just not in love anymore. Well, you were. What happened? You know, that same woman that you, would, you, would, you were willing to die for, now you hate her guts. That same guy that you couldn't do without, now you're trying to kill him. And so we have no fault divorce. We have websites that openly encourage adulterous behavior and fornication. You know, go to websites, hookup websites, isn't that what they call them? I don't know. Yeah, you know, you can find somebody to hook up with just for the night. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. And this has become normal in our society. Normal in our culture. And we don't say, wait a minute, that's wrong, that shouldn't happen. Let's, let's, no, we're not going to have that. They prior, we prioritize. This is, what a, this is a priority in this country uh, uh, of teaching children in school uh, 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 as young as even five and six in some school districts how to have sex rather than teaching that sex is, act, is an activity restricted between a husband and wife. And in fact, those who, who promote uh, uh, a sex education in school and say, oh, well, yeah, you know, they got to learn it somehow. Well, how about at home? But see, they, 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 they tell you, well, they're not learning it at home. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Well, they're not. It's mighty funny to me. I, 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 maybe I'm way off base. But it's mighty funny to me that prior to sex education and coming into school, the, the rate of uh, children born out of wedlock was extremely low across the board. Black, white, Hispanic, across the board, it was low. It's mighty funny to me that the family, whether white, black, Hispanic, didn't matter, all across the board, was intact. Poor, poverty, but the family was intact. Now, all of a sudden, oh, we got to teach these kids that because they don't know anything about sex, and, and they're doing out, and they're just ignorant, ignorant and we got to teach them, and now the illegitimacy rate has exploded. In the African-American community, 70%. I'm not making that up. That is actually true. 70%. In the Hispanic community, over 50%. In the Caucasian community, it's 40%. And all this has happened since we decided we're going to introduce sex education in our schools and to our, our children because they need to have this information. But now, wait a minute. The powers that be and those who know, know all this stuff and, and they're, they're the ones who, you know, they're smarter than us and so they know what's best for us. 
have determined that, wait a minute, we won't teach it with morality because, oh, we don't want to saddle the kids down with that kind of, of, of guilt. So we're just going to teach it, and we're not going to say be abstained because according to their intellectual abilities and, and how smart they are and what they know, uh, abstinence doesn't work. Because see, all these kids are born out of, out of wedlock, so abstinence doesn't work. Well, they're born out of wedlock because all of a sudden you came in and started teaching kids, this is how you have sex. Let me show you how I put a condom on a banana. Let me show you this. Oh, and, and birth control. They began to tell, I mean, when you're teaching five and six years old, come on, something's wrong. I think in most school districts, they start at least in the fourth grade. This is the, listen, this is the priority that our nation has set for our children. And every school district, bar none, this is a public school district, has a sex education class. Why? Because the federal government, wait a minute, the federal, yes, the federal government mandates it. That means that that school is going to continue to get federal funds, they better teach this. The federal government mandates it. So they have put a high priority on sexualizing your children by saying, if you won't do it, then we withhold federal money. That's what your government is doing. Why do I want to work within that system? It's corrupt. So if I work within that system, what they're telling me is, this is the program you have to go along with. At one point, when we were in Grand Rapids and our church was the building where we just recently left, we were relatively new in there. We hadn't started our child development center. We had a Head Start wanted to come in and use our facility for um, you know, a Head Start program. Well, you know, Head Start is a federal funded program. And, and a lot of times they use churches. You know, because church, you know, they've got the space and so forth and the parking and all that. We didn't have the parking necessarily, but we had the space. And so he said, we'd love to come in and, and run Head Start in your, your church. Oh, I'm like, that doesn't sound too bad. Okay. Well, then when they got, began to, and they came through to the facility, oh, yes, this work, this is beautiful. Oh, yes, we can do this, that, the other. But then we had to lose all of the uh, religious symbols. You can't have religious symbols up because this is a federally funded program. Wait, they, wait a minute, this is our church. This is our, our church. We, we can put up whatever we want to put up. But if we're gonna let if we're gonna get the federal money and, and they come in and run there, then we had to either cover up or get rid of all in all that or any religious symbols. Well, we politely declined because we, we and, and we didn't even have that many religious symbols that we, especially down where they were, but just the fact that they were saying, this is what you have to do. You have to compromise to go along with us to get our, get, get our money. We said, ah, that's all right. We don't need it. We don't need you. But you understand my point. This is what happens. This is the, this is the manipulation. And how many churches acquiesced and said, oh yeah, because they wanted that money. Not too long ago, they had what they call a faith-based, uh, um, what was it called? Yeah, faith-based, where they, you know, they, uh, the federal government gave money to churches. And I remember when that came out and I said, no, nah, I'm not even going that route. Why? Because you know there's strings attached. You know it's designed to compromise the church. And they've been very good at it. I'm not just, I'm not just blaming, I'm not saying, oh, the government. I'm saying what I'm trying to show you is our, our cultural norm is, hey, you know, we gonna, we, somehow, some way, we're going to, uh, 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 you know, make the church as, as irrelevant as possible in our culture. And they pretty much succeeded because we're always trying to work through the system. And by working through it and working in it, we compromise and compromise. They never compromise their part, but we always compromise our part. Well, we won't say anything. We'll hide our symbols. We won't talk about Jesus. We'll just, you know, we won't do that. And, and so then we preach service like, well, you know, we, they'll, they'll know us just by, you know, uh, by, you know we say, they, you know, they'll know you by your fruits. Yes, that's true. They probably will. But you know something? You got to say something, too. You have to say something because that's what we're compelled to do. Go out in the highways and byways. 
You can't work within a system that's designed to compromise you and ultimately push you out of the way. And so our strategy has to be we want to displace it. Move it out of the way and put our system in. And our system is the kingdom system. But we, we look, at, I, how, you know, look at our society. And that, now, we claim, we claim that we believe in the sanctity of life, right? But does it? Does it? Because if it believed in the sanctity of life, then it would do all it could to protect the unborn and the elderly. There will be laws against abortion. There will be laws against what's happening to some old people in some of these uh, uh, old folks' homes. There will be laws against it. We will protect our elderly. We will take the people who've worked hard all their life and now they've gotten old and infirm and we'd make sure that they're taken care of. We'd make sure that babies in the womb are taken care of. We would make sure that even babies, you know, born, after they're born, we make sure that, 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 that you know, if they have some uh, physical or mental defect, that, hey, we're going to look out for them. We're not going to allow anybody to do them harm. But yet, what we have in a culture that says it believes in the sanctity of life, we have a culture that says, hey, we believe in abortion up to nine months. And, 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 and this, is, this is how they manipulate you. This is how they manipulate you. They say, well, well we, want, we want people to have, we want uh, 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 abortions to be rare and safe. And then they always talk about how, oh, we had less abortions this year than last year. But yet, still, we had one. We had them. I don't care how many numbers were, how many were less. And then we say, oh, well, see, we're, we're really getting there. But we still aborted over a million babies last year in this country alone. And this country, the United States of America, goes to underdeveloped co uh, countries. And it is part of the policy, listen to me, it is part of the policy of the United States of America to go to underdeveloped countries and encourage them uh, to abort their children. That's the policy of this country, the red, white, and blue. The one many people say, love it or leave it. And yet, we say we believe in the sanctity of life. If we believed in the sanctity of life, then we would value every single life, born or unborn, young or old. We value it, but we don't. Oh, come on now. This is what the Bible says ought to be our priority. See, abortion is a priority in this country. All these things I've talked about, they're priorities in this country. You as a saint, you're not a priority. This is what the Bible says ought to be our priority. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whether with all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now you may say, well, we're Gentiles. No, we're not. We're kingdom citizens. Gentile there is a word for those who have not been brought into the kingdom. The Jews considered themselves different because they were kingdom people. So Gentiles are literally, uh, 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 in Jewish thinking, uncircumcised people. People without a covenant. People without a covenant. So Jesus says, now understanding this is the time he's living in, he's using this saying, he's saying, for all these things do the Gentiles or those without a covenant, this is how they think, this is what they seek. Those without a covenant seek food and shelter and clothing. He says, for all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father... God knoweth that you have need of all these things. He knows you need these things. So seek, but seek ye first the kingdom, God's domain, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. So he says there's two things you've got to seek first in your life. You have to have the highest priority in your life. The kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And he says, and all these things shall be added to you. Now I'm telling you, 
That's what, the, that's what Jesus says. That's what the Bible says. Has that become our number one priority? Has that become the thing that we're seeking? Has, is, is, have we prioritized the kingdom in our lives? Your greatest success in life is going to come when you place God as your highest priority. You'll never, ever succeed. I don't care. You know, you say, well, so has billions of dollars. You know, them and their billions can perish because guess what? Throughout eternity, $100 billion means nothing. Now, did you notice in that scripture that he said, even above what you eat, drink, and clothe, and, and, and have clothes? Well, listen, this is the deal. The basic human need is to eat and drink. That's the most basic human need. How many days can you last without water? Three, seven, maybe, I don't know, not long. How many days can you last without food? Maybe two weeks. I, you know, you starve to death. I'm just, I, I, you know, but it's not very long. So the basic human need is food and water. You have to have that to survive. You have to have air to breathe, food to eat, water to drink. But Jesus says, even above food and water, he said, make the kingdom your highest priority. He said, that has to be the highest thing, you, that, that has to be the highest thing on your list, is the kingdom of God. Before what you eat or what you drink. He says, your father knows what you need. He says, he'll take care of that. He says, listen, that's not your problem. Your problem is not getting something to eat or having something to drink or even having a roof over your head or putting clothes on your back. That's not your problem. Your problem is you haven't prioritized the kingdom because if you prioritize the kingdom, miraculously, God is always going to come through and bring forth the, the provision that you need in your life. During the, during the, during the uh, um, uh, uh, drought, the man of God went out into the, was led out into the desert. There was nothing out there. But guess what? The Lord led him by a little brook where there was water because he put God first. Then because he could put God first, he had the birds come and drop him off meat to eat. I'm, what I'm telling you, trying to tell you is this. When you put the kingdom of God first, it doesn't, you know, you may think, oh, I, there's no way anything can happen, but God will make a way out of no way. He'll bring forth the provision where there is no provision. He'll make it happen for you. The children of Israel had the same problem that we have in this world, and that is they had left the comfort of, his, uh, of Egypt they had left the comfort of the land of Goshen in Egypt with the millions and the, and the, and the uh, leeks and, and all the great delicacies that they were eating. And now here they are in the wilderness and there is absolutely nothing. Not even water. A basic human need. Not even water. And they complain to Moses. They say, Moses, have you brought us out here so we die of thirst? And Moses says, no, 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 that's not it at all. You placed your trust and your faith in God. You walked out of Egypt believing that God was going to take care of you, and trust me, he's going to take care of you. And when Moses did what God told him, water came out of nowhere. Enough, that, now think about this, enough water flowed out of that ground to satisfy over a million people and all of their animals. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. That mean that water was probably gushing out like a geyser. And whatever, and filling up every little depression around there. But that water was pop pumping out. And it kept pumping out and kept pumping out until everybody was satisfied. Like the man of God during the, during the drought when there was nothing and the woman had just a handful of meal and a little oil. And that's all there was. She scraped the bottom of the barrel and had to look, made that cake, gave it to him. But yet, guess what? She went back and there was some more meal. God does the impossible. That's why Jesus says, if you put the kingdom first, but too often we put our basic needs first. And many times we put first things that even, aren't even our basic needs. We're chasing after things that, that, that are, have, are, you, you really don't even need. 
But you prioritize that and chase after that and say, I'm gonna have, I gotta have this, I gotta have that because everybody else has it. I gotta do this because everybody else has it. And so we're chasing after things and God is saying, look, if you put me first, even down to your basic need, what to drink, what to eat, what to wear, I will take care of it. You know how, so now, wait a minute, now think about this. Now Jesus said those three things specifically, right? Think about the wilderness. So he provided water where there's no water. Then they had no food. So he dropped manna from heaven. Am I right? So where there was no place to grow crops, no place you could till, nothing you could do, he dropped manna from heaven. Now here's the third thing he did that most of the time we don't even think about. The Bible says for 40 years while they were in the wilderness, their clothes and shoes did not wear out. So the very thing Jesus talked about, what to drink, water, coming out of the ground where there was no water. What to eat, manna dropping from heaven where there's no kind of crops anywhere to feed that amount of people. And clothing to wear, their clothes that they came out of Egypt with lasted 40 years, their sandals lasted 40 years and did not wear out. God gave us a, a perfect illustration of what he can do when you put the kingdom first. And yet and still, this still was a rebellious people. This still was a rebellious people. How much more will he do for you when you prioritize the kingdom first? When you say, Lord, I put your kingdom and your righteousness ahead of everything in my life. I'm not looking, I don't care about what, where, where my next meal is coming from. I'm not concerned about where my next drink is going to come from or what clothes I have. I'm not concerned. I know you'll provide because the kingdom of God is my highest priority. Your righteousness is my highest priority. I mean, it's nice that you prioritize having a job, supporting your family, having or raising good kids, buying a home. But none of that stuff comes before God. See, what most people don't realize is it's easy to make a God out of something. They don't understand and don't recognize the fact that you can easily make a God out of something. And before you know it, that thing has become your highest priority and is not the God. It's something material. How, many, how often do we talk about... I, I tell you what, I, I'm... <laughs> It just kind of floors me how much people love their pets. Love them with all their heart. Anybody here know who Leona Hemsley was? She was a hotel uh, person. She owned, her husband actually, uh, owned, you know, just he was a huge hotel guy, had hotels all over the world. Well, he passed away, she became, you know, the uh, head of the company. And for years, she ran a company, and they still were very prosperous, very, very, you know, very prosperous. And uh, so when she died, she died, and she willed $12 million to her cat. See, that's foolishness to me. That's foolishness. You, you will $12 million to your cat? That's foolish. But she loved her cat so. So what does that tell you? That she had inordinate affection. Her cat had a high priority in her life. You don't give $12 million to an animal unless it has a very high priority in your life. You know, all the people that could have been helped with that $12 million, and I'm not saying she had to give it, it's her money, she could do with it whatever she wanted. Whatever she wanted to do with it, that was her business. But to a cat? Look at the Ten Commandments. Over in Exodus chapter 20, it lists the Ten Commandments. You can turn there if you want. But the first thing that God says, even before he gives the commandments, the first thing he says is, I am the Lord your God. Now, why does he say that? He says that because what he's helping him understand is you've got to prioritize me ahead of everything. I'm the Lord. Now, Lord, we understand what Lord means. We've been taught that. Lord means owner. I'm the owner. Your God, the owner. Your God who owns you. Your God who owns heaven and earth. Your God who owns everything. I'm that guy. And what he's telling them is, put a high priority on me. Then when you read the Ten Commandments, the first four, and actually the first five, 
But the first four directly speak because God prioritizes himself above anything else in a person's life. The first four directly are about serving God in the capacity he dictates. The fifth one, y'all know what the fifth one is? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long. The fifth one is about the relationship between child and parent. And he says, now, he connects long life with that relationship. And, what, and, and why is that the fifth one? And we always say the first five are about God because honor thy father and thy mother because when you're growing up as a child, your mother and your father are God to you. And that's to be expected. That's the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to look to you as the supplier of all their needs. They're supposed to look to you as their source. That is the way God designed it. You are supposed to reflect Christ to them. You're supposed to be Jesus in their life. So that as they're growing up and they see how what you have done and how you have blessed and how you all the things you've done for them, how you even forgive it. It helps them as they're growing to understand the relationship between them and God the Father. Amen? That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart. Because if you train them up in the admonition of the Lord, as the Bible says, if you train them up to admonish the Lord, to, serve, to see God as all in all, and how do they do that? They see it in you. Because you model Christ. Just like a, a mother models a, a, a virtuous woman to her, her, her sons and daughters, and a father uh, uh, models a man of God to his sons and daughters, we also, as parents, hus uh, fathers and mothers, model Christ to our, uh, our children so they see the relationship. Their relationship to us helps them better understand their relationship to him. That's why the fifth commandment is considered a commandment about God because once you honor your parents and the way you ought to honor them, it doesn't matter, mean that, you know, as when you're an adult, that everything they tell you to do, you got to do. That's not what it means because some people, well, you know, I'm your mama, I'm your daddy, you got to do what I tell you. You know, now when you're a kid, they better do what they, you tell them. When you're married and got children yourself, mom, I love you, but... But it's designed so that you, as a parent, model Christ in front of them, and then through that relationship, they understand the relationship between themselves and God, and they're able to transition, transition from the relationship of parent and child to now child and God. And they're able to make that transition so that when they are old, they won't depart from what you've taught them and modeled before them as children. That's the point. That's what it's all about. But the first five commandments are all about God then. All about God. All about how you ought to prioritize him. Well, you know, in our country and other countries around the world, we've taken some of the commandments and codified them into law. You know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Uh, you know, don't, don't bear false witness. We've said, oh yeah, you go to court and you commit perjury. Well, you go to, you go to jail for that, it's a felony. And so we've codified some of those things. But the first five, we haven't done. Because we don't want that relationship. That's the, 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 the rotten culture of the world doesn't want that relationship. But we want that relationship. We want it, that to be our priority. And here again, your behavior then reveals what you prioritize. How do you behave? How do you live? We have to be and behave as saints of God in a manner that illuminates Christ in the lives of people around us. We can't behave unseemly. We don't have the luxury just to speak our mind. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. No, you can't afford to. You need all the pieces you can get. We, amen. we don't have the luxury to sit around and talk about, oh, well, you know, this is what they did. We have to model Christ no matter what, no matter where, no matter to who. We have to model Christ. 
I can't afford to sit around and, 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 and just act the way my flesh wants me to act. I've got to illuminate Christ to everyone around me all the time, 24-7. This is what the Bible says in Romans 12, too. I'm almost done. Be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. What does that mean? Don't be conformed to the culture around you in this world, the world's culture. Don't, be, don't, 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 get, don't get hoodwinked and bamboozled by how they're trying to manipulate you. I'm amazed. I'm telling you, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at the fact that there are people a lot smarter than me who know a whole lot more than I do, higher IQs than I have, and yet they continually fall for the things that the world puts out to them. They're continually being manipulated and allow themselves to be manipulated. But Jesus says, don't be conformed to that. But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. In other words, Jesus is saying you have to have a paradigm shift. You have to think differently. You have to begin to see things differently than what the world is what the world is presenting to you. Man, I'm gonna tell you something. I can read something that they put out and I can tell I can see the slant in it a mile away. I can see exactly where they're coming from. Why? Because I'm a kingdom citizen. I'm a child of the king. My mind has been renewed. So I can see the, the junk that they're putting out there. I can see how they're trying to manipulate you and get you to think, oh, well, that's not so bad. Oh, that's okay. That, that's, not, that's not so, that's, I mean, you know, I mean, come on, everybody needs this. And slowly but surely, they wear you down. But Jesus says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the only way you're transformed is by the renewing of your mind. And when you're renewed in your mind, what begins to happen is you see the garbage that, uh, for what it is. You see the manipulation for what it is. You see how they're doing things. You understand it. You see it. You don't fall for it. You don't go near it. You stay away from it. And he says, through that method, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because after all, that's what we're here to do. Prove, to, uh, prove the, what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. All the time, every day. Y'all with me? Last verse, Ephesians 2.10. You can turn there since we don't have the screen. For we, you and I as kingdom citizens, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, he said you've been created to good works that God has already determined that you're going to do even before the foundations of the world and that you should walk in the things that God has ordained for you to walk in. I haven't been ordained to be manipulated by the world, to let their priorities be my priorities, to allow them to hoodwink me and bamboozle me. I mean, I try and understand how can any rational person, how can any rational, right-thinking individual believe in evolution. Now, I'm sure they're on the other side in their little conferences or uh, wherever, their little, their little evolution church is saying, I don't see how any right-thinking person can believe in God. But here's what's on our side. Everything, everything that has been made has been made by design. Nothing is made by accident. Your car wasn't, trains haven't been, Airplanes haven't been, nothing. Everything has been made by design. So that has to lead me to believe that ultimately the entire universe was made by design because nothing is made without design. Nothing is accidental. But they want me to believe that everything is accidental and we're just accidental and everything just happened to fall right into place as a happy accident. I don't think so. I don't think so. Lastly, let's just talk for two minutes about behaviors because I think behaviors are important. And I said earlier that your behavior reveals what you prioritize. 
let's look at just a few of the behaviors, and I'm just going to name them off and won't even explain them. Uh, I think they're self-explanatory. Uh, behaviors that are exhibited in our culture. Children's behavior in school. Talking back to teachers. Disrespecting them. I'm not saying it's in every school, but it's in enough. It's, a, it's to a point where it's a, it's a problem. And schools aren't able to uh, uh, produce good students because of a lot of the behavioral problems on both sides, not only students, but also teachers. How about people's behavior at work? See, I've always been under the mistaken notion that people go to work and they do their job and they act right and, and so forth. I've been under that mistaken notion. And I've had enough of you guys clue me in, oh no, people act a fool at work. They do all kind of crazy stuff at work. Threatening folks and they have to have security, walk them off the job and cussing out the, uh, you know. This is the way you take care of your family. And now you're gonna lose all that because whatever. And lastly, even people's behavior in church. When they don't agree with the pastor or the deacons or the trustees or whomever, or don't agree with the what, whatever they don't agree with the church's policies. I don't know why y'all do that. I had one person tell me, I ain't never been to a church where you spoke, you gotta do, the, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you, you're supposed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, participate and, and, and work in the church. Really? What kind of church you been to? Because everyone I know of and all the pastors I know, they want their people to be involved and, and to, to, you know, do, you know, you know put that, get, their, get their in there and, and, and get an auxiliary or department or whatever they call it and be participatory. And, you know, behavior. And so their behaviors tell you what they prioritize, how they look at life. And that's what behavior does a lot of times. It, it shows you how a person looks at life, what they prioritize, what's most important to them. Make sure that your priority is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, the kingdom and his righteousness. Now, I didn't really talk a lot about righteousness, and I will at a later date, but the righteousness of God, having that right standing, that's, these are the most important things. Amen? Let's stand on our feet.